But in the meantime, the Palestinians, the Arabs, the Persians, it, the, Russia, it doesn't matter who comes against Israel. God is going to protect Israel. He is going to protect them until the time is for him, his son to return. Israel will always, always, always be a nation. It will never be wiped out as a nation again, ever. God has promised that. Look how God has already said that. Oh, I, I, all the Palestinians that are already there in Jerusalem. Yep, yep, lots of them already there, and it, the promise is there. But uh, he, I'll tell you another thing that God has set up on this issue because it's such an interesting issue. If you go to like a dance hall, there will be Jews in this little dance hall. Two hundred people. There'll be eighty different languages in that one dance hall, and the fact that they have. I'm telling you, it will not be another generation before the Lord comes. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because when people move back to Israel, they learn Hebrew. And then the next generation speaks Hebrew, right? Right now, they have the infrastructure to spy on every nation of the world in their own language. And they have people that are in these countries. They have people in Iran right now that are... They know this. I mean, the Iranians know that there are spies for the Jewish people that are Jews that are carrying Persian names for the past 300 years or whatever. And that's how they got the viruses into these things. That's how they keep getting all this information. And this isn't just Iran. This is everywhere. There are synagogues in the very backwoods of China. These people have been there forever. They speak Chinese. That's their language. Some of them go back to the land of Israel, just like some of them leave America. I am telling you that they are set up right now to be able to fulfill the end time events and I don't think in another generation it'll be that way because they won't have the same language and this ability that they have right now I think that it's going to be real soon I person this is just me you know I, I, I she knows I thought this in 2005 too but we're getting closer and closer in the world you know Greece is falling apart and then Ireland is falling apart and all of these countries and it, that is exactly what is being lined up in Europe, Europe has to be lined up because the person that's coming to be the Antichrist is going to be from where? Europe. But what, what specific Italy. part of Roman. Italy? He's Roman. Italy. It says the prince of the people to come back in Daniel 9.27. The prince of the people who come. So the people have already come. They destroyed the temple, but it doesn't say the prince is coming in that time. It's somebody future, but he will be of that people. He will be a Roman. So we're, we're going to be in that... Revelation 17 in about one more week on Sunday, and I can't. I, this is one of my favorite verses because, well, I, I can't wait. Go ahead. What's the trigger if if, uh, if if Israel does not now recognize Jesus as their Messiah, and they won't recognize him until he the end them, of the tribulation what is period? The trigger. I have no idea. Okay. They are going to know. And here's how we know. I'll read this verse and then we're getting into Genesis 49. I'm going to read this verse so you know that they're going to know. I've read this before and you may not have been here. But this is from the book of Zechariah. And I think it's 12. It might be 14. It's going to take me just a second to uh, find this. 12. I know. Um, oh, yes, you do. I'm sure you do. Um, it says yeah, right here. It says in 1210. I've got a burp, so if I do, I'm sorry. I, uh, and I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one who mourns over his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. Now, John quotes this at the cross. Okay, So the initial fulfillment of this verse is the cross. But the Jews rejected him. And so it's not fully fulfilled. Okay, here's what it says. It says, In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem. Jerusalem again. It's Jerusalem. It's the seat of power. It's what it's speaking of. Just as... Okay. So, um, like the morning at... Uh, I'm in 12.11 uh, right now. In that day there shall be great mourning in Jerusalem like the morning at Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo. And the land shall mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and the, their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of Shimei by itself and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain. In other words, this is at the end of a great period of testing. All the families that remain, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. Something is going to precipitate their calling on him. And when they do, he is going to return and they are going to, as a collective people, say, we were wrong for 2,000 years. God's going to remove 
the, the veil. But yeah. and, and that goes back to Romans 11. Yeah. That goes back to Romans 11. Yes. What we were saying, they are partially blinded now until the fullness of the Gentiles, which goes back to the, 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 the temple being built. That last stone is in there. They will start to understand this, but they are still going to go through the seven years of tribulation without Jesus. And there's something that will come at the end and they will realize their mistake. I don't know what, what the impetus is, but yes, God will remove that veil. But how it's going to happen, who knows? Okay, anybody, Genesis 49.1, please. I know, that was a long one. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you which shall befall you in the last days. Okay, the last days, the end times. Uh, I believe the term here, which is also in um, the Song of Moses, Genesis I, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 4, verse 30, he talks of the last days. And the term is akrit, meaning the eschaton, the last days as far as eschatology is concerned. Okay, so this is, this is part of what they are going to inherit, but it's also looking all the way to the end of days. Okay, um, go ahead, verse 2. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. Okay, so he is acknowledging that his son is the firstborn, okay? And he's saying that you were, because of that, the excellency of dignity, the excellency of power. He's acknowledging that he should have been the one that was placed above his brothers. Okay, go ahead. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel. Because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, then defilest thou it. He went up to my house. Okay, so do you remember the account there? Everybody here remember that. This is when Reuben went up and slept with Bilhah, his fourth, we'll call her a wife, although it, it calls her a concubine elsewhere, but it's his fourth wife who bore some of the children of Israel. Okay, and Reuben went up and defiled the bed, and I will be quoting that particular verse under a completely different context if I ever, here's what they said, here's what Seth said, and he, he said, um, uh, we're going to be doing a, a thing on 1 Corinthians, and he says, um, pick a chapter, and you're going to be preaching on it, I want to have one sermon per chapter, because I don't want us to get lost in the woods for the trees, or lost in the trees for the woods, or whatever the term is, and so I said, okay, um, I, I said, I'll do 1 Corinthians 5, I just knew that's what I wanted to do, and uh, so... I thought when we started Corinthians four weeks ago that I'd be preaching in five weeks because 1 Corinthians 5 and 1. It took him three weeks to do chapter 1 and then he started chapter 2 yesterday and only got through 10 verses. So there's at least one if not two more weeks. So what I did, I, I typed up the entire sermon and I condensed all 13 verses into one sermon, which is kind of hard to do. You really have to squeeze stuff together. and um, uh, But... Then after that, not only is chapter 2 going to take at least one, if not two more weeks, but then we have those two uh, interim sermons. I don't, it might be Christmas. I have no idea. Anyway, so, well, whatever. It is what it is, but, um, uh, you know, I've been telling people it's going to be in five weeks. And then I said, well, it's going to be in five more weeks because they, and then it's five more weeks because it took three <laughs> weeks to do chapter one, not two or one. So, anyway, whenever it is, it is, but until that point... Um, I will be quoting that particular verse in a different context, and I hope that you enjoy how I weave it together because it's, it, it's a really neat thing. But the interesting thing about that last part, because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. The last time he ever addresses his son Reuben, he addresses him in the, the second person. Okay, He went up to my couch. And he will do this again elsewhere in this, this blessing as well. But to me, that's a very sad commentary that he would actually not say, you know, you are my son. It, it, it just, it, 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 it ate him up right to the last day. Go ahead, five. I'm still, oh, Simeon and Levi are brethren. Instruments of cruelty are their inhabitants. Okay, and you know what he's talking about there? Yeah. It's where he, they went in, their daughter, their sister Dina got... Uh, molested by Shechem, the son, the son of Shechem, and so they went in and they killed the whole town. And so he is saying that these guys are some brutal dudes. Go ahead. O oh my, oh my soul, come thou not into their secret, unto their assembly, mine honor, 
Be thou not united, for in their anger they saw they slew a man, and in their self will they digged down a wall. Dig down a wall. I don't know. Mine says, uh, in their self will they hamstrung an ox. So it's obviously a very tough verse to understand. And so, uh, anyway. What one is that? That's uh, six. King James Version, you know, the old terminology too, maybe it means they hamstrung an ox. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, it's, just, it's hard for me to understand. But yeah, it says, for in their anger they slew a man. Actually, they slew a whole town of men. And in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Okay, go ahead, seven. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Okay, so it's funny how he says, I will divide them in Jacob, because he is the one that's making the, and then I will scatter them in Israel. But what he is doing is he is saying, I will divide them in the land that they inherit as Jacob and in the land of Israel. And was that fulfilled? Yeah, Levi, yeah they were all scattered in all the towns. Right, they had no inheritance. They were the priests and they were scattered throughout all of the towns. But what about Simeon? Was that fulfilled? Anybody? The answer is that if you go to where they're dividing up the land, Simeon uh, they, it, it says, and I'm not going to turn to there because I, it'll take us a while to find that one to waste your time, but Judah was given their inheritance. They went through all of these tribes and gave them their inheritance, and Simeon didn't get any. And all it says is that Judah had too much room for itself, misquoting this, but Judah had too much room, so Simeon got some of their land. So they're scattered within Judah, okay? So it, it, it was literally fulfilled as he said. I will scatter them, and I will whatever it says. So uh, that was fulfilled. Simeon and Levi were just simply scattered. And so there's really, even though there is a tribe of Simeon, they're not this one little area, like you think of Naphtali as its own area, and Gad has its own area, and Asher and Joseph, and all these different tribes have their own area. Simeon is just scattered among the Judaites. Okay, um, well, I won't get into it now, but once again, that, that particular verse and a reading of it is part of knowing that there are no ten lost tribes of Israel. We could do the study again, but I've already done it in here a couple times. If anybody ever says to you, the ten lost tribes of Israel are up in Afghanistan, or they're over in uh, India, or whatever, they're not. There are no lost tribes of Israel any, anywhere. They are not British is Israelianism, which believes that they are the ten lost tribes of Israel. It's not the Mormons who believe that they are the lost ten tribes of Israel, or these nutty people up in um, Ohio, or whatever. It's it's like a, a sect of the Church of God, and they say they are the ten lost tribes of Israel. There are no ten lost tribes of Israel, and if you want, we can do the study at some time, but I've done it twice already. Um, and the New Testament bears that out. The New Testament bears out that there are no ten lost tribes of Israel, as does the Old Testament after the exile of the ten tribes. After the, uh, it, Some of you look like you have a, a question on your face, so I'm just going to tell you without going through the study. After the 12 tribes, or the 10 tribes, the 10 northern tribes are scattered, which were supposedly lost 10 tribes, after that time, at least eight, if not nine of them, are mentioned again in the Old Testament after the exile. People from those tribes are mentioned, okay? Which means that God has done exactly what he promised. I will save a remnant. There is a remnant from every tribe. In the New Testament, Paul says it and Peter says it. This is the hope that our 12 tribes are waiting for. Present tense. Okay? So, the fact that he says our 12 tribes are waiting for this hope means that the 12 tribes, he knew that they existed. And thirdly, where was Paul from? Ben... Ben... Benjamin. Benjamin. Oh, he's from Benjamin. And then we have Simeon that blessed um, Jesus when he's named after his tribe, Simeon. Blessed Jesus at the temple. We have Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of... Asher, who was in the temple, the 80-year-old lady, or had been uh, widowed for 80 years. And uh, so there are other people as well mentioned in the New Testament, all from tribes that were supposedly scattered. There are no ten lost tribes. God did not forsake his promise to the people of Israel. So just so you know that, don't get, don't get sidetracked by those people that say we're the ten lost tribes of Israel, like the Mormons. They're not. Okay, please, go ahead. Eight. Judah, thou art... He whom my brethren shall praise. What does that mean? Why did he say that? You are the one whom your brethren shall praise. What does Judah mean? Um, what did Jesus come from the tribe of Judah? But what does it mean? Judah means praise. So he's making a little pun on his son's name. Son's name, right? Judah, you are the praise. You are the ones your brother shall praise.